So uh, I'll, I'll talk briefly about the uh, organic solar cells and a few snapshots of the research that we do. Uh, as uh, was mentioned, the balancing the energy is, is important and uh, we try to look at it different ways. We're looking uh, at uh, organic materials or if you like disordered materials. So just as a brief introduction, when you have a nicely ordered crystalline uh, material, you talk about uh, energy bands. We know that we start to introduce disorder. It's first you see it as uh, the appearance of uh, traps or uh, tail states. And when the disorder is large, especially when you do printing, then you have a high disorder and you have a, a, a localized density of states, the most popular of which is the, the Gaussian tail. And this is really well known uh, in the literature and people have worked on, on this kind of disordered materials uh, for decades. So basically in these materials, charges are hopping from molecule to molecule and uh, we know the, how to write the rates, we know what uh, determines the rates, we know the average distance or the density of the film is very important, how well the molecules talk to each other, this is the coupling. Everything is really known and documented in, in the literature and, and in fact, there have been many numerical uh, works uh, analyzing this kind of systems and we do the same, only with a slightly different motivation. We can crunch it all uh, with a very sophisticated engine, but our goal at the end is to not just produce the graphs, we want to get simple analytic uh, expressions like the device level model. So we are interested in something you can really work with and not just numerics. And we want to go to this kind of uh, simplicity levels. So one of the things we got out of this kind of model is the realization some 10 years ago that all disordered materials tend to be degenerate semiconductors. What we've learned recently is when a, a semiconductor is degenerate, the, the average energy of the charges changes with density. This is built into the degeneracy of the system. So basically what it means is when the system is degenerate, the carriers carry with them an extra energy which no one counts for. So basically if you go and you want to look at the basic equations, the drift diffusion, this is not adequate anymore for degenerate semiconductors. And basically you have to replace it with an equation that will take into account the gradients of the energy. All it means is that when you have very high energy, most likely when you are close to open circuit conditions, you have very high charge density, there starts to be an effect which is called pressure, electron pressure, and that affects the energy balance of different reactions in your system. And this is something you have to take a, a really good care of. It sounds surprising in this context, but basically, if you look at uh, astronomy, this is what keeps uh, white dwarfs uh, from collapsing, the electron pressure, and this is because it is a degenerate star. So the same happens when you go to really high uh, charge density, especially in this type of semiconductors. So this is one way of looking at the electronics of the system. You need to treat the energy balance in a slightly different way when you look at these materials. The other thing you want to do is you, you, you look at molecules, you want to try and play with uh, the generation of uh, charges. So for example, one of the uh, molecules we deal with are simple nanocrystals. This could be indium arsenide nanocrystals or other nanocrystals. And we know that you can uh, look at uh, the periodic table and see what would be the electronegativity of each atom. It means the, its tendency to pull electrons toward it. And you see we have here the indium and the arsenic here with uh, values around two. And you see that you solve this kind of structure, you'll get an energy band, the LUMO or HOMO or conduction band and balance band. And now if you want to tweak it, you can start and dress these atoms. So if you dress them with phosphors, there won't be much difference, it looks just the same. You dress them uh, with a uh, sulfur, you see that there is a dipole being created at the surface and the bands are shifting. So this way you can start and go from LED type homojunction to heterojunctions and of course you can go even farther by choosing a different uh, atom. You enhance the dipole and you get a really large shift. And this is uh, something which is important to be able to break 
the charges in uh, materials will have a, a relatively large binding energy. The nice thing that we came across by mistake is you can dress it by more than one color. So if you dress this nanocrystal with a mixture of uh, atoms, as is shown here, what you get actually is within the nanocrystal, there is a polarization built in, a stark shift inside the nanocrystal simply because we coated it in a, in a, in a different way. And this could be, these two works can be found in these two papers. It was started by uh, Michal Soreni and continued by uh, Nir Yaakobi. And since we do it all uh, in solution, these coatings, there would be some organic ligands attached to these uh, atoms that dress the, the nanocrystal. Just to show you that this is not uh, just uh, an idea, what we did is we made a, a solar cell, which all it had in it is this effect. It was a homo material made of a single type of uh, nanocrystals. So basically, it has a very limited uh, response uh, as far as the solar cell. And then we introduced the, this uh, effect of uh, polarizing the nanocrystals. We didn't do anything about extracting the charges or anything beyond that. That was uh, only done later on. And only this effect of polar polarizing the nanocrystals showed us that there is a really nice uh, enhancement. So this is one thing that we could use to, to enhance the solar cells. Of course, for working solar cells, you have to have more than just a, one a building block or one technique. So this is just one that we've added to the junctions, heterojunction and PN junctions, just simply polarizing and uh, manipulating the bands inside a, a nanocrystal, which is a quantum dot. The whole radii is around three to four nanometers. And you can play with that as well. So really, in introducing stark shifts helps to dissociate the charges. If I uh, look at something else that we do on, on the optics, and we, it's easy to explain why we do that, because you've already heard that there is a well-known uh, thermodynamic reciprocity between solar cells and uh, light emitting diodes. It changes a little bit when you have to take into account some binding energy, but the re reciprocity still uh, <coughs> remains uh, unchanged. And what we are looking at, typically with this kind of technology, we're looking at the uh, disordered uh, optical systems. You can think of the disorder as it impacts the spectral uh, content, which sometimes uh, often is called the uh, coherence, the angular distribution of your molecules or the absorbers, the emitters. The fact that especially it's not homogeneous by nature, and the, you, you would expect bands and dents, especially that now everyone is want, going for flexible. So what we did in, in that respect is uh, so far it's just uh, modeling. The modeling is done by uh, Ariel Epstein and uh, P.D. Inziger in our department, and I'm just uh, piggybacking on, on that uh, activity. And the idea is that you can start by looking at a very general structure of a light emitting diode. It has uh, two contacts on uh, the two sides, a, a semiconductor in between, something that couples it to the outside. And you can write simple terms that can account for all that's happening to optical rays that are emitted in the structure. Of course, similar things will happen to rays coming into the structure. And you can really write an analytic formula that really takes into account everything that's inside. You have a, a reflective metal. This is an image source. So the higher the reflectivity, the better it is. You have the effect that uh, the semiconductor is not just uh, one monolayer. You, you absorb on a wide range or you excite on a wide uh, special range. That would introduce another factor. <coughs> the fact that some of the rays go out directly, you lose them without them bouncing inside the structure. That's something that you can't avoid. <coughs> As we said, we have some cavities, incoherence effects, and of course, there is also the fact that the dipoles don't necessarily align in the structure in the way that you want them to be. So all these things can be put together in one analytical term. It's hard to see from this crowded film that there is a simple analytic term, but really with a few parameters, this is a run, uh, there's no simulation here. This is a simple expression 
but in a 15 minute talk, it's hard to, to convince you that it's simple. But once you have these building blocks and you have everything analytically, you can take it one step further and play with the, the way it's built. So you could think of something which is bent, like uh, flexible uh, devices, and you apply the same basic uh, building blocks only in a slightly different way to adapt, be adapted to it, and you end up with the same set of terms which are analytic and simple, and that can help you follow if you have some kind of uh, bends in your structure or, or places where it's split. And you may think that this is uh, imaginary to expect these kinds of bends on dents, but actually this is what people are doing nowadays by structuring devices. They introduce uh, in specific places some bends in the structure, some dents, and now we have an almost a uh, ray optics uh, model that can follow these things analytically. And as I believe that as we found in the semiconductor analysis when we were trying to follow the charges that numerics can take you a, lo a long way, but at the end, if you want to make a, a really jump, you have to go to analytics. I believe that this work of Ariel and uh, Penny Inziger will uh, help us do that with the, the photonic structures of, uh, of these devices. So basically, this is a snapshot of all uh, the things we are doing that is uh, somewhat related to photonics, nanophotonics, and, and solar cells, and uh, thank you. Questions? <laughs>